Hello, and welcome to Sobercast. We provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast format. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into the virtual basket. Also, if you're a member of NA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, NAPOD. NAPOD features NA speakers and workshops in the same format as Sobercast. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for NAPOD, N-A-P-O-D, all one word, on any podcast player app, or go to NAPOD.XYZ if you'd like to listen online. Hope you enjoy the podcast and have a great day. Hi, I'm Alexis and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Alexis. And uh, thanks for coming to this workshop. Um, as Richard said, what I'll do is I'll speak uh, on each of the concepts and then I'll um, basically, we'll have any questions that anyone has about the 12 concepts. Um, so, the 12 concepts, it's, um, they actually, in my experience, they can be applied to kind of all areas of my AA service work and even in my, my 12 step work, some of them um, can be applied there. And um, with... Um, to give a bit of background on the concepts, I think it's quite important for me to kind of under, that's where one of the things that I, I really helped me to understand them was to realise the historical background really, uh, and where they came from. And I'm sure everyone's aware of the, the 12 steps, and the, how those were kind of the experience of the first hundred uh, alcoholics, and how they recovered. Um, and some, some years after that, uh, Bill Wilson realised that, um, all of the, you know, AA, the 12 steps working, these people getting sober, and um, there were these groups forming all around the country. Um, but he was getting, uh, Bill was kind of doing a lot of work in the central office in New York. Um, and he was getting a lot of letters from people saying, our group's having problems, we're having controversy, we're having arguments, you know, we're worried the group's going to fall apart, people are drinking, and so forth. And, and he, he realized, um, with the help of... Um, one particular letter that he was sent. He, he was basically sent a letter about another organization of alcoholics called the Washingtonians from about 100 years before AA who had helped each other to stay sober. And, uh, but they got involved in controversy and, and, and internal arguments and politics and all of these sort of external politics and all those sort of things. And uh, they'd fallen apart and they'd all died drunk. So Bill realized from all this stuff he was getting from the, the groups, from the experience, the historical experience of the Washingtonians, that AA was um, in danger of falling apart, basically. And he condensed this together into another 12 principles, which uh, were the 12 traditions. Um, and it took a while for the fellowship to accept that these were important, as important to AA as the 12 steps, but they did in the end. And um, these principles are now, I mean, we have them up, during our meeting, we have the traditions and the steps stuck up during our meetings. Um, now, <clears throat> as time went on, um, AA's general services grew and grew. Uh, it, it, when AA first started, it didn't have these, these general services. And, um, essentially, it was one alcoholic talking to another, and, and that, was, that was really it. But uh, eventually, as time went on, um, people started to realise that it would be helpful if you, they had literature, like the big book, if they had um, phone lines that people could call. Um, and um, basically, these, what, what Bill realised, there were some people who were saying, well, we need to keep it simple, um, you know, just one alcoholic talking to another. But Bill realised that if there is any service that we could be doing for the still-suffering alcoholic, if there's anything we could do to better enable the carrying of the AA message, the still suffering alcoholic and if we don't do that we're letting down the still suffering alcoholic and this was a vital insight I think that's like the fundamental insight that Bill had for our general services and from that point on our general services just grew and grew and um, the group started to realise the importance of contributing to these general services and as I mentioned earlier this central office in, um, in New York appeared um, and we have a central office in the UK as well in, in York um, now, the point came where Bill uh, felt that the principles which had worked in the running of these general services needs to be codified as well. And that's where the 12 concepts come from. 
just as the steps came from the experience of what does and doesn't work, and people lived and died based on learning that experience, the traditions came from the experience of you know, what does and doesn't work in, with AA groups, and groups died as a result of, of learning that experience. So the concepts come from the experience of what works and doesn't work in the general services. Um, and as Bill said, if we don't, if we don't uh, ensure the survival of these general services, we're letting down the newcomer. Now, the <clears throat> it, it, actually in the 12 concepts as well, there are many, many things which can be applied at all levels of service. But when he originally wrote the 12 concepts, he was thinking about what he called world services. And I think he had this vision at the time of kind of the world office of GSO in, in New York, kind of, you know, an AA worldwide, the general services being coordinated by this world service office. As time went on, they realized that countries could in fact have their own central service offices which were answering mail, distributing literature, helping new groups form circles, like we have in this country, we have a general service office in, um, in York. And um, so these, although in the 12 concepts he talks about the world services, uh, you can also kind of replace that with the phrase um, national services, which I often think when I'm reading them. Um, okay, anyway, enough, enough background. Let's just give you some historical background. What I'm now going to do is go through the concepts one by one. Um, to give a little bit of my experience uh, with the help of a I've also got a brilliant concepts checklist here I just have to give a, name, give a name check to my sponsor who came up with this which gives some great ideas of how to apply the principles of the concepts um, to, to my, my home group work and my group work and so forth so starting with concept one and bear in mind as, as, I, as I read a concept and you hear the phrase world services you can replace that with national services Concept one. Um, okay, quick, quick. One last thing before I say concept one. This book, the AA Service Manual, combined the 12 concepts of world service. When I want to really learn about the 12 concepts, if I want to learn about the 12 traditions, I can be 12 Steps and 12 Traditions book and, and um, Traditions Illustrated. If I really want to learn about 12 concepts, this is the book to guess. And it has the concepts each have an essay attached to them in this book and those, they're, they're brilliant essays they're brilliant read, I've read them again and again and again they're really good, but that's how I've uh, learned about the concepts in, in theory form anyway, and I'm reading from the short form of the 12 concepts here, concept 1 final responsibility and ultimate authority for AA world services should always reside in the collective conscience of our whole fellowship so this came about um, another realisation that Bill had that led to concept one, um, <clears throat> I think Do Dr. Bob, I can't remember what precise year it was, but essentially Dr. Bob, the co-founder of AA, Bill W. Dr. Bob, Dr. Bob died of cancer. And um, Bill had a, a very deep realisation of his own mortality, I think, and how that affected Alcoholics Anonymous. Because at that point, the um, people could always run to to Bill and Bob when things were going wrong with AA and so well, particularly with the world services because Bill was you know, intimately involved in, in the general service office in New York um, if things were going wrong people could always run to uh, Bill and Bob and say what do we do what should we do and, um, and generally people would listen to them they were well respected throughout the fellowship but then Dr. Bob died and it was, it was just Bill and Bill, Bill started to think what happens when I die you know, I want, AA's got to survive. I mean, it's all about letting down the newcomer. If you let AA general services die off, these services that distribute the literature, that organise the phone lines, that help AA start in other countries, vital services. What happens um, when I die? How can I ensure the survival of these services? What happens if the general service office in New York um, makes some financial blunder? They make a screw up. There's a miscommunication. And the group starts to think, well, sis, who, what is this office acting for us? What, are they, what have they done? They made this big mistake. And they basically lose, lose faith in that, that office. And the, suddenly, and that office, all it's funded by is the money that we put into the pot at the end of meetings. And then we, we vote, yeah, we'll send a contribution to intergroup, that contribution to region and so forth, up to eventually that contribution reaches the general service office and pays for the salary and pays for this office to run. And Bill thought, what happens if the groups think, well, Stuff you lot, you know, don't, don't kind of, uh, okay, can I continue? Okay, um, 
Where was I? Yes. Um, the General Service Office. Yeah. So the group's thinking, right, stuff you, General Service Office, who are you to spend this? I mean, GSO in, in, in York, largest clients of the Royal Mail in York, million pound a year turnover. GSO in New York, I mean, huge cor- size of a corporate office, ten million dollar turnover. What happens if the groups one day, one day turn around and say, who the hell do you guys think you are spending all our money? How do we know you spent, you know, all of this? And, and now, when Bill and Bob were alive, even when Bill was alive, Bill could have said, listen, and he could have explained, so we need all of these. He could have, you know, this is how it's all built up. This is why we need it. And people would have trusted him and listened to him. But once Bill was dead, who would explain all this? There is an executive committee, the General Service Board, that has trustee responsibility, a bit like a steering committee for, this, for the General Service Office and its AA members. And, but who, who knows any of those members? No one knows the name of the members of the General Service Board. Well, I mean, people do, but I suspect most people in this group, you don't even know the names of your general service board. Um, so Bill was worried the groups would stop sending money and these, these services would fall apart. The, the phone line would fall apart. The literature would no longer be published and distributed. New groups in new countries or new cities or new towns, it would, would, you know, where would the service manual come from? Where would the guidelines come from? And very slowly, a huge effect would filter down into all the groups and finally to the newcomer and to saving lives. You know, and so this was, um, he knew he had to protect this somehow. And he saw it was a, and, and, and the first thing was, well, who's going to, when I die, <laughs> in fact, he handed over, he, he didn't wait till he died. He, he, he waited, when AA came of age, when they had that big meeting in St. Louis, uh, in St. Louis, um, Bill essentially said to the AA groups, you are now responsible. You now have to take responsibility for your services, you have to, you, you, you have to, um, and you have to have the ultimate authority. And this is what concept one is essentially saying. Um, he explains the mechanics of how they do that in concept two. But it's very important, it was an important thing for me to realise what he was saying. It's, you can't come running to me all the time. <laughs> he says, I just want to become a normal member of AA. You have to take responsibility. You can't, be, you know, it's like a father saying to a child, take responsibility for your life. Um, so, um, that was that was concept one, and um, the um, you know obviously he talks about the the group conscience now, not just of a, a single group, but a group conscience of the whole country, of the whole world. So he's extended what he does with a lot of these. He takes a tradition, and he extends it into a, a much larger and gives it gives it more detail, um, goes into more detail. But here's he's extending the group conscience and don't, don't just run groups by the group conscience. We run the whole of AA by the group conscience. Um, now, some um, some ways in which this can be, you know, on, on, a, on a simple group level, how can I apply this concept one? And one of the simplest things is the first link in that chain of the group conscience from a group to worldwide to nationwide AA, what is it? It's the GSR. My GSR represents my group. In this country, GSR used to be called General Service Representative, and then some bright Spark decided to change the name to Group Service Representative, totally missing the point, essentially. GSR is a General Service Representative, represents my group. Um, And um, so does my group have a GSR? It's a simple question. If my group, uh, following Concept 1, does it have a GSR? Does my GSR go to pre-conference? You'll see the point of that as I come to Concept 2. And um, then looking just within the group, you know, do all members of my group? contribute to the group conscience. So this concept can be applied in, in a number of different ways on a national level and even on a group level. So now, of course, the question is, okay, Bill, you said, so I, I tend to use the name Bill quite freely. I, I really look up to the guy. It's like Bill said this, Bill did this, Bill did that. And anyway, so Bill says, you guys have responsibility, you have authority. And um, then, then, you know, you might say, well, all right, so what is it? In this country, I think we've got 25,000 members of AA. In uh, worldwide, I think we've got over 2 million members of AA. Now, obviously, it's a bit impractical for 25,000 people to get together to have a national group conscience meeting. And it's a little uh, in- ineffective for a world conscience to be have a meeting with 2 million people somehow, fit them into a large hall somewhere. So, Bill solved this problem with concept two, and with, with basically the idea of representation. What he said is that... Um, we have a, we've already got, we've got our national services in York, you know, and world services in New York. Um, we have 
a general service board, which is like a national steering committee, who essentially have oversight of that of that office. Um, now, what what Bill also put, he put, and then we have the groups and GSRs, and he put, and then he filled. There's a gap. He saw there was a gap, and that gap he filled with a new, very large committee. In fact, he didn't call it a committee. It was so large he called it a conference. A hundred people, basically. Um, give or take 20. I think at the last conference I, I went to, there's about 110 people. That's it. And these 110 people would be delegates from all around the country, um, together with the members of the General Service Board, the National Steering Committee, and they would meet once a year. Um, and that would fill this gap. He saw that that would fill this gap between the groups and the General Service Board and the General Service Office, i.e. these very important national services. Something else I just want to slip in here as an aside. The national services, there's something else about national services which is easy to forget. Um, obviously, we have things like literature that needs to be done nationally. We have the, 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 uh, the, the, uni, the um, unified phone line that we needs to be done nationally. But there's, the other thing is we have national newspapers. We, the probation service is, is run nationally. Um, actually, I think it's England and Scotland, but, but nationally, for, for, to keep it simple. Uh, we have, you know, government offices are run nationally. A lot of offices who essentially create the policy for the people that have first contact with the still suffering alcoholic, but probation officers, prison officers, these, these national offices create um, the policy for, um, uh, for, for doctors and nurses and um, national professional organisations for psychiatrists. National newspapers and television stations who kind of have the, the majority of the communication lines, you know, between individuals and, and they, they can reach out to people like no one else can, this national media. How do you interface? How do you, how do you communicate with the national organisations and national offices and national media? You do it on a national level. You do it in a coherent way. So, as well as these other general services that I've talked about, which, you know, publishing and reading and so forth, you, you need, if you're, we need to, um, be communicating nationally with the media and with, with these various organisations. So um, that's just slipping that in. I should have said that at the beginning. Um, so anyway, we have the conference filling in this gap. And um, why does the conference fill this gap? Well, this gets this is a, an interesting point here um, <laughs> and has caused much discussion and debate over the last two years. The GSRs vote in the delegates. Simple as that. The GSRs decide who the delegates are for their, for their region, um, in our case, in this country. Um, that's what Bill said. That was the spirit of concept two. The GSRs choose these delegates. They hold the delegates accountable. If the delegates don't go and carry the conscience of the GSRs to the conference meeting when they meet with the General Service Board and representatives from the General Service Office, then the GSRs can vote out these delegates. That's how the direct accountability comes in. Now, Unfortunately, I don't mean to be controversial, but in this country, the GSRs don't vote in the delegates due to a misunderstanding of the concepts, particularly the spirit of the concepts, and for what I can only think of historical reasons and reasons of ignorance, really. Um, one region, London Region North, the GSRs vote in the delegates. There are other regions who are looking into the GSRs voting in the delegates as well. But this was Bill's vision. And uh, I'm sorry to start, on a, well, not start, but I'm sorry to reach concept two and already give a negative point, but in this country we haven't quite caught up with the spirit of the concepts. But this is, isn't it, that's why it's so brilliant that Bill wrote these down. If he hadn't wrote down these concepts, if he'd have just thought, cause some people were saying to him, we've done the steps, then he said, let's do the traditions. People said, no, we don't need traditions, don't even write that down, don't we, just shut up, come and talk about your spiritual experience, don't talk, about, don't talk to us about the traditions. And then with the concepts, when he wrote the concepts, people were saying, well, do we need to write all this down? Isn't this too complicated? You know, it's not simple. You can't write. But if he hadn't wrote this down, we would not be having the current debate that we're having in this country, which was, why are we not following the concepts? So, you know, thank God he wrote it all down and made it clear. So that's, that's concept two. The General Service Conference of AA has become, for nearly every practical purpose, the active voice and effective conscience of our whole society and its world affairs. And at this point, the principle of delegation comes in, which is fundamental to, um, to the concepts. And it's, um, it's talked about in the traditions. Bill, Bill talks about uh, the uh, trusted servants. So what he's doing is he's taking the idea of trusted servants and he's starting to expand on it here. He's saying that 
all right, we give ultimate authority and final responsibility to the groups, but then the groups have to delegate some of that to their conference delegates. And um, I've just actually, I'm just about to rotate out as a conference delegate. Uh, there's, there's six in the southwest region, and there's uh, 15 UK regions, uh, each with six delegates. Um, but yeah, the, the groups delegate some of their uh, authority and responsibility, and that's how the conference is formed. And each year, the delegates can question and debate with the General Service Board up in York and um, find out what essentially our National Steering Committee have been up to. Um, so that's concept two. Um, and uh, I guess in terms of what individual groups can look towards is, you know, are we taking part in conference? Do we understand what's going on at conference? Do we know what the, the agenda is for conference this year? Do we know what the conference decisions were? Because um, conference discusses things like what new literature should we do? Are we happy with this piece of literature? Um, the national phone line came as a result of conference discussion and debate. So the decisions at conference directly affect the newcomer. Um, and um, that's concept two. And I guess the parallel, the nearest parallel I could think of to this, if you're thinking of our, our steering committee at this group, you could think of a little bit like the General Service Board. Um, and then each time we have a group conscience, it's a little bit like a conference meeting. Uh, but we can all go to that group conscience. We don't have to send delegates because there's, it's basically, it's, it's, if, if we had 25,000 members in our group, we couldn't have a group conscience. But because we're, you know, 100 people, um, we can twice a year actually all meet and we can hold our steering committee to account. We can take votes and talk about the decisions during the year. Um, concept three. <clears throat> the next three concepts are all, they're all um, rights. It's, they're the three rights concept. They're where Bill makes statements about three very important rights. There's actually four rights. Um, and they are the first, concept three is the right of decision. Concept four is the right of participation. And uh, concept five is the, the right of appeal and um, petition. And uh, concept three, to ensure effective leadership, you should endow each element of AA, the conference, the general service board, and its service corporations, staffs, committees, and executives with a traditional right of decision. A simple question here. Okay, how, how do we define... Uh, Maybe there's a better way to come at this. Suppose you've got a, a TLO where, at an intergroup. Um, or suppose, even simply, you've got a secretary at a group. Again, okay, a new situation. Uh, basically, something comes up uh, at the beginning of the meeting, uh, before the meeting starts, when the service officer comes up and asks the secretary a question. The secretary's never come across this before, but feels that they have enough experience uh, to answer the question, to give a directive. Yeah, like, yeah, do that, key person, or yeah, do that, literature person, that's fine. Now, what they could have done, they could have actually gone up to the GSR and their sponsor and the group chair or whatever and said, you know, what should I do about this? What should I do about that? But what they did is they, they used their right of decision. And what the right of decision says is that each service officer essentially decides when they should ask people uh, what to do and when they should actually when they just do it themselves um, because otherwise the way that what Bill sort of particularly in um, as, as the service positions were, were kind of more and more national got larger in scale that defining these service positions get very complicated you can end up having loads of bylaws defining this service position and 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 he saw that the simplest thing to do and this this is this is an, uh, an expansion on the concept of trusted, on the idea of trusted servants. Saying we will trust our servants, we will give them the right of decision to decide when they should ask what to do and when they should make that decision themselves. Now, in fact, that example I gave of the secretary isn't a great one because really the correct example would have been that secretary saying, "All right, everybody, shut up. I've just had the tea person ask me if he can go and buy some more milk. So I'd like everybody in here in the group to vote." Can the tea person go and buy some more milk? It's, uh, it's seven o'clock, so we probably need some more milk. And like, everyone's like, what? But, 
basically we expect the secretary to use their right of decision at that point and just to think, yeah, all right, yeah, I can decide to go and buy milk. And then if we all had a really big problem about them buying milk, then a group conscience, you know, Johnny, I shouldn't mention any names, but <laughs> Johnny would have decided to say, I don't think we should have bought milk on the 21st of April at 7 o'clock. <laughs> that was a really bad idea. And this is the other side of the right of decision. You know, we trust our servants, but trust is earned. And the way it's earned is we are able to hold our servants to account. So we can say, so with a conference delegate, at pre-conference, uh, the GSRs go up and they say to all the delegates, right, regarding that new piece of literature, we don't like it. Uh, regarding that idea for some new national phone line initiative, we, we love that. Regarding this, that and the other, we, we're all into that. The delegate goes up to conference, passes on... Um, some of the stuff, the, the stuff that he's heard, and also, but then the decision comes off a conference, um, an urgent decision. Um, the Charities Commission have just said to us that blah, blah, blah. So some, something that basically has to be done uh, at, and within, within a period of a, a few weeks or something. Uh, and the delegate then, the delegates can, could then choose to just to vote on that basically, and not to have to go back to the groups and say, what do you think of this, what do you think of that? And then when they come back to the post-conference meeting, after conference, if the GSRs don't like what the delegate's done, they can rip them to shreds. <laughs> you know, that was an exaggeration. They can, <laughs> they can lovingly question and hold him to account. And hopefully one day they'll actually be able to vote the guy out. You know, but uh, that's, um, that's the ideal. That's what Bill really saw in the rights decision. Uh, is that, that um, GSRs could actually just not re-ratify a delegate. So that's right of decision. The right of participation, this is, I mean, this taught me so much when I started reading about right of participation. A few years ago, um, as, as this group kind of grew, everyone was doing loads of service and people started to queue up to do service and like, actually it wasn't that long ago now, I think about it. No, no, the first time this happened was a while back. And there were lots of members of this group doing service at Intergroup. And the Intergroup turned around and said, We've got loads of people doing service, and every time there's a vote, you know, it's like half the hands going up are, are from the same group or whatever. And of course, it, that's totally irrelevant because everyone votes in their own conscience. You know, people don't block vote, they vote on their own conscience. But, and one of their suggested solutions, um, actually I think this was at region, not integrate, one of their suggested solutions was take away votes from the liaison officers. So basically, on a region, liaison officers can't vote. The chair and the, the, the secretary and treasurer can vote. The region reps can vote, but not those liaison officers. Now, uh, somehow Bill foresaw this problem. <laughs> you know, he, he saw this coming. And he, he kind of focused on at the conference level. He said that the, 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 the general service office staff, the main general service office staff and the general service board should always have a vote at the conference. But he, this, this principle applies, as Bill says, to all levels. And he basically said, you don't take away the as officers vote. You don't take away people's votes on a committee. I remember thinking about this, and suddenly I, I realised, of course, a committee acts by voting. There's no point in going in, in as a committee together. You have a meeting, and then everyone goes off and does 20 different things. The point is, everyone comes together, they have a discussion, there's group conscience, everyone votes, the committee acts as one as a result of that. Why, how does the committee act as one? Because of voting. So to participate in a committee, I have to vote. And I've heard no end of rubbish. I was up at conference recently, and I, I won't say it, but I had somebody <laughs> uh, saying to me, oh yeah, our, our GSO staff get to participate on committees. And I said, do they have a vote? And they said, no. I said, well, they don't participate. Then. And that's the right of participation. And, and it comes down, Bill brings it at the end of his essay on Concept 3, brings it down to some, uh, on uh, Concept 4, he brings it down to something very simple, which is... Uh, it's a spiritual need to belong. You know? And, um, yeah, somebody, you, you simple thing, people will be demotivated. It doesn't make, it just doesn't make any sense to have somebody who is an integral part of that committee and to waste their experience and their knowledge, um, when they're on that committee. Uh, so, you'll be pleased to know that it didn't happen at Region. They didn't take away the Liaison Officers' vote. And another thing came at Intergroup, and this one, they didn't take away the Liaison Officers' vote. And once again, thank God Bill wrote these down. It's just, it's amazing. Um, so um, uh, the the other right, the uh, right of appeal, the right of petition. I mean, this is this is brilliant. Um, okay, basically, voting's all very well and it's very important. Um, 
But sometimes what can happen is people get obsessed with this idea, well, if a majority have voted for it, then it, it goes through and that's it. You know, and this is, this, is, uh, this is something that, in fact, political activists and theorists realised ages ago was a load of rubbish. Um, that you don't, and, 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 you know, I mean, the idea, obviously, back in Greek days, ancient Greece, all right, that's when they used to consider democracy meant that, oh, yeah, the majority always get their way. But, like, in the last however many hundreds of years, people realised that democracy on its own is very dangerous because you get a majority just repressing the minority entirely and crushing them. And, and majority gets angry, and we all know, like, the effect of crowds when they're all getting wound up or, you know, whatever. And, and essentially, this, uh, a long time ago, people saw the danger of just giving total power to the majority. And that's where the concept of liberal, the idea of liberal democracy came from which is where you, you, you still give power to the majority, but um, you protect the minority as well. You put in checks and balances to protect the minority. Um, and Bill talks about some guy I'd never heard of before I mentioned, before I read this essay, D- Talkville, um, and uh, he, how he talked about the dangers of that. But, so concept five is essentially there to protect the minorities. Um, and that when there's been a, when there's been a debate and, and a vote, um, on some issue, whether it be a conference, <clears throat> whether it be an intergroup. Um, I mean, I was at a conference recently, and unfortunately at the moment, conference in the UK is very short. We're only we're like two days long in terms of time. Um, in the US, they're five days. But we've got it all crammed into a short time. And I mean, there just isn't a lot of time. There isn't enough time for debate. And you really have to, but, but I've, I've used this before when, when the debates happened and there's been a vote and then I might put my hand and say, actually, I've got a minority opinion. <laughs> I think you're talking rubbish or something like that. Yeah, got a minority <laughs> opinion and then put, put the, put the opposite opinion and just try and get this over. And I've seen, in fact, at the last conference, there was some literature that was blocked from being published. And, um, then late, and there was a vote that stopped from being published. Then the next day, a minority opinion was stated and a new vote was taken, and that literature got through. Um, and basically, that's, that's the way it works. And it also, um, the other thing about the minority, a lot of the time, the minority can be right. You know, there's not necessarily a link between who's right and how many of you there are. Just because there's 51% of you think something doesn't mean it's the right thing. And quite often, actions and the right actions and things that have moved this fellowship forward have come from minorities. So uh, Bill knew that not only, and it helps unity as well, because if you have an active minority being just crushed down by whether a conference or intergroup just being ignored and crushed down by the majority, you get disunity because they get annoyed. Whereas if the right of appeal and the right of petition are used to let minorities have their say, then they'll feel, at least I've, I've had a chance to give my arguments. Everyone's heard my arguments. You know, so I'm, I don't feel so bad about it. Um, but I've been in situations where this hasn't been followed at conference, and where and it, the, you can just feel I've just, you can just feel people sitting there just thinking, "This is a joke." And all that would have happened to take away that feeling, another ten minutes, another ten minutes discussion. You know, that's how simple this is, and that's the big difference it can make. Is you can have delegates leaving conference thinking, "Yep, I've, I've, I've had my say, I've done my best," and or someone leaving conference thinking that no, they didn't listen to me. So that's uh, concept five, um, and um, concept. Uh, just, I should just cross-reference this a minute. Um, <clears throat> I mean, actually, I've noticed in our group conference meetings that, uh, and at the, uh, that, that the chair will often say before a vote, "Are there any minority opinions?" So this can apply to, at, at any level of service, um, and. Um, That's, um, that's concept five, isn't it? Concept six, right. So we've done concept one, groups are the boss. Concept two, they delegate most of that authority and responsibility to the conference delegates. Concept three, four, and five, the rights, the three rights. Concept six um, is another piece of delegation, all right? A hundred delegates that meet once a year they can't run AA's general services. Um, this is this. So what Concept Six is recognising? It says 
The conference recognises that the chief initiative and active responsibility in most world service matters should be exercised by the trustee members of the conference acting as the general service board. So what's that saying essentially is this steering committee that I mentioned, National Steering Committee, on a, on a day-to-day basis really the conference have to um, give that committee their right of decision and let them get on and do the job. You know, and uh, one thing about the General Service Board National Committee, it's a registered charity and um, it's incorporated and we don't want to start doing stuff like incorporating 110 delegates um, and um, you know, you don't want a letter sent out by the General Service Office every time they've got some something they need to do or every time the General Service Board wants to do something they have to send a letter to the, to the conference. So essentially Concept 6 says that the conference will you can hold the General Service Board to account once a year at conference, but aside from that, you know, they need to be able to get on with their job. Um, so, that's as simple as that. Um, now, Concept 7 talks about the relationship between the Board and the conference. The Charter and Bylaws of the General Service Board are legal instruments empowering the trustees to manage and conduct World Service Affairs. The trustees are the members of the General Service Board. The Conference Charter is not a legal document. It relies upon tradition and the eight purse of final effectiveness. Now, this is, this, I, I think this is great. <laughs> I, I think this, is, this, was, this was a really clever bit of stuff by Bill. Right, you've got the General Service Board who have legal control over our General Service Office. Right, this million pound a year turnover in the US, $10 million a year turnover. The General Service Board in the UK, in the US, they are legally empowered to do what they like <laughs> to that office and to all the funds that go to it. and That's their legal situation. The conference charter says um, that what right, I'll just explain the conference charter. It's in the it's in the UK service literature, and it, and it defines the the conference. It also says things like a two thirds vote if, if a two thirds majority of a vote in conference is binding on the general service board. So com- two thirds of the delegates in conference say the two thirds of the voting at conference say to the board do this. They have to do it. A simple majority vote at conference is just a a suggestion to the board Um, and a three quarters vote at conference they can can fire all the board they can rearrange the board that's what the conference charter says now one of the questions uh, is well if the board are legally allowed to do what they want with the general services with our national general services but the conference have this three quarters and and two thirds voting rights and so well how how does that fit the conference has no legal power over the General Service Board. And what Bill said is there's two things that basically give conference that power over the General Service Board. And um, the first one is tradition, respect, basically, the General Service Board respecting the status of conference. Um, And the second one is the power of the AA purse. Now, this seems like it's quite a blunt instrument, the power of the AA purse, but it is ultimate authority. (laughs) Because uh, the General Service Office can only run because the staff are paid, because the the office rent is paid, you know, it, it needs money. Every penny, oh well, a, the, a large quantity of the money to run that comes from the groups putting money in the pot and that money being passed up to it. And what Bill's essentially saying, he's saying to the groups, if you don't like, uh, to the conference and the groups, if you don't like what the General Service Board are doing, and if they're ignoring you, because they've got a legal right to. If they're ignoring your conference that you've delegated the authority to, stop sending the money. Simple as that. Now, they've got a year's supply of money uh, up in York to keep running the office. They could keep going for a year. Then after a year, slowly, the whole thing would just fall apart. You know, there wouldn't be money to run the office to pay the staff. There wouldn't be money to hold the the GSB meetings for no general service board initiatives of uh, meeting with national organisations or the media none of that could happen there'd be no money for it and this is the ultimate power this is the this is the kind of ultimate authority that the groups have most of the money comes from us so um, that's what uh, what concept 7 is saying is that the relationship in the end what guarantees the relationship between the conference and the general service board is money and tradition, it's respect and, 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 and the power of the AA purse. So, um, there is a pattern in these concepts. 
as there's, there's this pattern of delegation, what they're essentially doing is they're moving up from, from the groups to conference to the board, to how the board relates to conference. Um, and now it's going to talk a little bit in concept eight um, about the, um, the relationship between the board and the general service office. We all felt he needed to say something about that. And uh, concept eight, the trustees are the principal planners and administrators of overall policy and finance. They have custodial oversight of the separately incorporated and constantly active services, exercising this through their ability to elect all the directors of these entities. I just have to step back one concept. Power of the A purse doesn't just apply to the General Service Board. It applies to any part of the A service structure. If you don't like what your intergroup are doing, if you don't like what your region are doing, don't send them money. If you really, <laughs> you really, you know, if, if it's that bad, if you feel, or if they're wasting money or whatever, this concept says you just, just don't send the money. Um, so anyway, but uh, that was just another thing about concept seven. Concept eight, the, uh, the trustees have this, cu- it's described as custodial oversight of the general service office. Now the general service office has a manager, uh, called the general secretary, and she's a professional manager. She seems, I, I mean, I've met her a few times. She seems very professional um, and um, efficient and, and, and hard-working. And, um, I mean, these these people at the General Service Office, they work, I mean, the hours they work, bloody hell. They're there, if you think about it, they're, they're there at, like, a lot of our committee meetings are at weekends. And these people go to our, uh, go to the National Committee meetings often. Our conferences are at weekends. They go to these. I mean, it's not a nine-to-five job. It's hard work working at the General Service Office. And, um, anyway, so this is all managed by the General Secretary. And she does the day-to-day management. Now, obviously, I don't know how many of you are aware of the dangers of micromanagement. I don't know if you've ever had a boss who's always over your shoulder, like saying, do it like that, no, you're doing it like this. You just say, look, tell me what to do, go away, let me do the job, you know, and I'll deliver you what you need, you know. And um, what this is kind of uh, saying is the General Service Board have custodial oversight. They don't ring up the General Service Office every day and say, right, has everybody got in on time? Are they working hard enough? You know, all of this, it's, it's not... It's a custodial oversight, and um, they do... I know that the chair in the UK, the chair of the General Service Board, is in fairly regular contact with the General Secretary, but that's. But it's not to constantly manage the staff there. Um, and um, they talk about, in this concept, it talks about um, that this custodial oversight is, is exercised through the General Service Board's ability to elect all the directors of these entities. Now... It's a little different in this country. We have a much smaller general service office and we don't have directors. The main piece of custodial oversight that we have is the general service board will interview and choose the general secretary. And, you know, if the general service board are ever unhappy with the performance of the general service office and feel that it's the general secretary's fault, they they can fire her. So that's the custodial oversight that they have. Um, And by law, they have to ensure they do that properly. Charities Commission uh, have, have an oversight over them. <coughs> now, um, concept concept nine. Concept nine is a uh, is a uh, about leadership. So Bill has taken what he's done is he's taken this part of um, uh, the traditions, which is a tiny little bit. And I remember when I first came to AA, and for the first year I didn't understand much about the traditions and people going on about. But this is, I've heard it, so it's like, there's no leaders in AA. There's no leaders in AA. And then, you know, it kind of, it, somebody pointed out in the traditions, well, our leaders are that trusted servant. There are leaders in AA. AA is full of leaders. And Bill actually writes an essay on this. He felt something more needed to be said about leadership. Um, that, that, um, and, um, the, this, this concept kind of has two, two purposes. First of all, it's to try and say, look, we do have leaders in AA. And, and we, we have to, we need, to, we want leaders in AA, and these are the principles of good leaders in AA. And he has an essay all about that. And that essay is, uh, I've, I've, I've recommended that to corporate managers. I think it's such a brilliant, I mean, if I could achieve half of the things in that essay in my day to day management job, I mean, I would be so chuffed. It's a constant vision for me. And he talks about stuff I've never read anywhere else. Like he talks about vision. You know, this is, <laughs> he talks, he, right, vision. And he gives practical step-by-step of instructions how to have vision in business. Now, I've never seen anything like that before. 
um, how to, and he said that's so important in, when we're looking, when the stakes are high on a national level, even on a regional level, even in a large group, you know, in an AA group, you need to think what would the effect be if I change this? You know, what could happen two years down the line? And he talks, Bill talks about how leaders have to kind of, they have to look at some change that could come along, some new policy, whether it's a group, national, or whatever level, and think, what will the effect be in a year, two years, five years, and so forth? Um, and he goes through various things about how leaders can be, uh, will have to be unpopular at times. I mean, a leader will always be in a minority, by definition. <laughs> and there are times when leaders will be very unpopular. Um, and the, t- the, the, the excellent thing about how le- uh, progress is, is often uh, a series of improving compromises, which I found so useful in, I mean, uh, uh, intergroup and region, when to compromise and when not to. And sometimes you just have to compromise to move forward on policy issues. Um, the other thing about leadership, he talks about sponsor sponsorship being a form of leadership, and this is one where this always gets me, and this always gives me a kick, a kick up the behind. It's like, am I expecting more of my sponsees than I would do myself? Am I setting an example? And something, and uh, so that kind of on a personal level gives me a kick, but also on a service level, when I'm doing service, I'm always thinking how I act at this intergroup will have an effect on anybody earlier in service who's watching me. How I act at this region, how I act at this conference will have an effect. So that's where this concept is so important, because I'm going to rotate out of service eventually. So the best thing I can leave is my example. And that actually probably is one of at least a 30 to 50% motivator for me, especially in the last couple of years of when I'm in, when I'm in a service situation, what sort of example am I setting? Um, and the other thing with this concept, as well as the SL leadership and general issues of leadership, is he saying primary world service leadership, once exercised by the founders, must necessarily be assumed by the trustees. Um, so he's saying, now we've got that link between the groups and the general service board, it's a little safer now to, for, the, you know, for the general service board to um, take on some of that authority and responsibility that, that you know, Bill and Bob had. That, that link's vital for that to be, uh, to be done. But um, he's talking principally here about world service leadership, the actual services in New York and New York. And I mean, Bill was very involved in the world services in New York. And what he's saying is, I, I won't be able to do that. You know, you're going to have to, general service board are going to have to do that. Um, so, uh, last three concepts. Service, concept 10. Every service responsibility should be matched by an equal service authority with the scope of such authority well defined. This is something that, like, before I read this concept in the essay, I knew, I knew of it, I knew about it intuitively to a, to a degree, but I didn't really understand it. And I used to kind of manage people outside of AA, and I'd ask them to do stuff, and then I'd be kind of saying, how are you, are you doing it like this? Are you doing it like that? And they'd get really annoyed if I was like saying, how are you doing it? And, and trying to, and, and, um, and they said, look, if you're going to ask us to do this and blame it, if it, us if it goes wrong, you should let us choose how we do it. And somebody actually said that to me, that reported to me once, said, if you want me to take responsibility for the results, you've got to let me do it the way I think is best. <laughs> then when I read this essay, I understood what she meant, basically. And uh, that's what it's saying. Every, you have to match responsibility with authority. If you're going to blame me for getting it wrong, let me choose how to get it right. And um, in Concept 10, Bill goes through, in, in a sense, everything in Concept 10 has already been said in the previous nine concepts. And what Bill does in the essay is he highlights in all of the links in that chain. I mentioned this chain that goes through the concept groups, conference, general service board, general service office. In all the links of that chain, he highlights how he's tried to keep um, authority equal to responsibility all the way through. And, um, for example, the right of decision. It's one of the biggest uh, guarantors of this, um, this principle. Concept 11... Um, Trustees should always have the best possible committees, corporate service directors, executives, staffs and consultants. Composition, qualifications, induction procedures and rights and duties will always be matters of serious concern. Really snappy concept, that one. I used to just read that and stare at the words and not quite understand where it was coming from at all. Um, But I think one of the things he's trying to capture there, and I I realise this, one of my service positions I did was I was on the Literature Committee, uh, which is the the, the UK Literature Committee, where we, we actually... We are a, a committee run by the General Service Board, and we produce a lot of the literature. So we, 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 uh, 
revised literature, we produce literature like the GSR pamphlet and the guidelines, a lot of, a lot of those are produced by the UK Literature Committee. Now, this concept is all about those, those committees and those subcommittees. Now, probably a lot of you didn't even know these subcommittees existed. But the General Service Board has about uh, that this work that I told you they do to do with national telephone stuff, national media, national probation, national uh, prisons and all that, they do it through these subcommittees. There's so much work to be done that what they do is one General Service Board member collects a committee of 5 to 15 uh, AA members around them experienced and knowledgeable, and they actually go out and do the groundwork on, on a national level. And this, this, this uh, concept is saying, uh, you know, th these committees, they have, to, they have to work well. Let's not just focus on the board. These committees have to work well, because they are very important. Um, and we have a slightly different structure of committees in the UK compared to the SA. Um, but he, he goes through, he also goes through a number of interesting principles uh, he, he, it's quite hard in the concepts because he, he realised when he wrote these they're not as snappy as the steps or the traditions you know, they can be long winded in places and uh, the, this particular concept he ends up writing like a series of headed paragraphs because there's, no there's no better he couldn't write a flowing essay of principle and all of that he, he couldn't kind of do that it's a series of paragraphs each with headings and there's things for example about um, executive direction versus policy formation which I think is very interesting. <laughs> that would send everyone else to sleep. But that, 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 very simply, that concept is the actual executives in, in the general service office who are doing stuff, um, they, um, they, they can sometimes get so enthusiastic, people, are, and, and this can be applied not just to general service office, to things in general, people can get so enthusiastic about what they're doing that they start to create new policy. You know, like, for example, they may start to break the traditions. And this is an important point that they need, you need to make sure that... Um, people are, that these people are actually undertaking service and not kind of breaking traditions and not creating new policies. And, and um, we've had examples of that with board service committees kind of just through enthusiasm to try and do a good job and get more alcoholics in. have kind of pushed the boundaries of the traditions sometimes. So this concept's all about that and it's about the, the link between money and um, the... Uh, I'll actually... What the headings, there's only a few in here, so if I just mention the headings, it's probably the easiest thing, which is basically, uh, he repeats, full participation of paid workers is highly important, so really it's the principal participation again, um, rotation among paid staff workers, we don't do that in the UK, it's an interesting question, why do we not do it, is our office too small? In the US, every year they change their assignments, can you imagine doing a job where every year you change your assignment? But these people in the US office, they're all like AA members, and, and, and apparently the unity that it creates and, and the, the lack of conflict is meant to be uh, very good. Uh, paid workers, how compensated? So he's stuck that. He managed to fit that into concept 12. If you pay them peanuts, you get monkeys. We're, we do not pay people charity wages, the people at the general service office. We pay them the same wage you'd pay a corporate worker. Because we're not really a charity. I'm doing this to keep myself sober. Um, just because this is on CD, let me say, we're not a charity, but the General Service Board <laughs> and the General Service Office is a charity uh, and, and fulfills all the requirements to be a charity. And the other point, status of executives, that's the one I just mentioned. So there's kind of four points he goes through and he talks about the, the subcommittees as well in Concept 11. So it's a very loose concept, Concept 11, but he collected together all the last bits that he, he had left in. And it's kind of the top of that chain, you know, it's the subcommittees of the General Service Board, it's the individual staff members and their rights in the General Service Office. And finally, Concept 12 um, is... <laughs> concept 12 basically says the conference... The conference must follow the traditions, must follow the spirit of AA. And, I mean, this is so important that the, the, the General Service Board, the General Service... Because the General Service Board are part of the conference, really. The conference isn't just the delegates coming from the regions. It's also the General Service Board and, and the, the members of the General Service Office who attend. And it says, the conference shall observe the spirit of AA tradition. And he goes through a number of things, uh, taking care that it never becomes a seat of perilous wealth or power. There's a lot of money controlled by the conference. You know, the, that sufficient operating funds and a reserve be its prudent financial principle. But just because got, we got all this money, let's not hoard it up. You know, you can have the same issues that you could have in a group. And I, I remember the first time our group realised we were in danger of hoarding money, like it was about 12, 11 years ago, and we, we knew we had to donate it or get rid of it. And you have just the same thing at conference. 
Bill calls this the AA Bill of Rights. He says it's so important, Concept 12, that only three quarters of all the groups, unless three quarters of all the groups in the world decide to change it, it can't be changed. Because he knew the conference is, is, has so much authority delegated to it that, I mean, if it went wrong, it could go badly wrong. And once again, if the conference falls apart, where would we be? So, um, <clears throat> And then, that it placed none of its members in a position of unqualified authority over others, that it reached all important dis- uh, decisions by discussion, vote, and whenever possible by substantial unanimity. This relates back to um, the minority opinion, and I- I've seen this go wrong, this part of the Bill of Rights, and I've read out from it at a conference, I've read this bit out, um, the importance of substantial unanimity in voting two-thirds majority, as many people, you know, keep the discussion going. It's bad to spend another 15, 20 minutes talking about it, even if you're going to vote the same way, because you can end up with more people supporting it. That its actions never be personally punitive, nor an incitement to public controversy. The conference has the money and the communication facilities to send out a letter to every group in the country saying, that Mr. Blah Blah, he's he's a right dodgy geezer, breaking the traditions, doing this, doing that, we don't like him at all. You know, the conference mustn't do that. Um, And... um, that it never perform acts of government, and that like the society it serves, it always remains democratic in thought and action. And once again, Bill uses this as kind of a catch-all for some really quite mind-blowing scenarios. Talking about the idea of vision, Bill applies vision here, and he says, um, he says, what happens if like an AA2 emerges? What happens if like 50% of the people in AA all decide they've got a better method, and they go to off to form their own AA? And uh, he says, well, we don't do anything about it. And he explains the reasoning for it. And he, he talks through all of these quite, um, quite unlikely but possible scenarios which could have such an effect on AA and how to deal with those and how it relates to the AA Bill of Rights. And um, that is the twelfth and final concept. Um, I guess that is the end of my, the formal part of my talk. So, I, I think the two things I'd like to end on, just to say, first of all, if you want to learn about the concepts, read the essays, then read them again. <laughs> They're just brilliant. Uh, the spiritual politics, they are beautiful essays. And the other thing I'd like to say, the concepts, and Bill says it himself, do not just apply to conference. They talk about conference again and again, the board again and again. But we use these concepts in our group. They're used at intergroup. They're used at region. You know, they, they are principles which, if I really want to feel I'm giving 100% in my service and I'm, I'm, I'm following the principles laid down by the old times of AA. I, I, I want to follow these principles and the 12 concepts and all my service work. Um, and that's it. Thank you. you go, like this. This works, but it's now open to questions from the floor and those wishing to ask questions, please raise your hand. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.